This panel is about remote work, remote workies, tel telecommuting, remote offices, anything related to that, establishing a culture around it, how to support it, what things you might want to do, what things you definitely shouldn't do. Um, so we have a bunch of panelists here who have been doing remote working for a number of years, including myself. And um, we'll start by uh, introducing each other. I'll let each panelist introduce himself, uh, and, and I'll go first. So my name is Doug Hughes. Uh, I used to do remote work it was a while ago, unfortunately. My current job requires me in the office, and that's one of the things that we'll discuss in movement. What's that? Oh, it's out in the hall. Um, my, my current job requires me in the office, but I used to work for uh, Global Crossing. And when I got hired into Global Crossing, uh, into the engineering division, the entire division worked remotely. And uh, it was an interesting experience. And so there was a culture there from the beginning of um, establishing and supporting that sort of communication, including you know, paying for the remote telecommunications, the things that you need in your remote office, et cetera, et cetera. Gradually, through uh, cost-saving measures, they, they moved away from that, which I think turned out to be a mistake. Um, they also lost a lot of morale in the process. But it did happen, but what I really want to focus on is the things that can make telecommuting work and um, how your organizations can support that. Uh, Wade. Hi, everybody. My name is Wade Minter. Up until a week ago, I was chief technology officer at a company called TeamSnap. TeamSnap did mobile and web tools for managing youth and adult recreational sports programs. Uh, much like Doug, as of a week ago, I am now working in an office, so that's going to be kind of an adjustment for me. I'm going to see how much I can kind of push that company to uh, embrace a lot of the remote work paradigms that we got going at TeamSnap. I started with TeamSnap eight years ago as a side project. It was a couple of guys in Portland, Oregon who ran a web design company. They worked out of their house. I was in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, eventually, we ended up spinning that product out into its own company with a CEO in Boulder, Colorado. He worked out of his house. Uh, we didn't have any money. No one could move. We couldn't afford an office, so we all kind of just worked out of our houses. And that ended up working out pretty well for us. So as we grew over the five years or so that we were a company, we ended up settling into a model where pretty much everyone on the engineering side of the company was remote. We had people in Michigan, Florida, DC, Long Island, St. Louis, California, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you were not on the engineering side, you were probably located in Boulder, Colorado. But even if you were in the Boulder office, you probably didn't come in a whole lot. So we ended up with a somewhat of a hybrid model that worked out well for us. And I'm looking forward to chatting a little bit about some of the stuff we learned. Bill? So my name is Bill Lincoln. I am the director of site reliability engineering at Pythian. Uh, we're a managed service provider, so we provide consulting to uh, lots of different clients. Uh, I've kind of worked in the remote space for the last 10 or 12 years or so, because I live in New Hampshire, which is the middle of the woods. So uh, getting IT jobs in New Hampshire is kind of hard, so I always had at least an hour and a half one-way drive. So I was uh, kind of living the uh, three-hour commute and then managed to work from home. You know, I was that one or two guys that got to work from home at mostly office type of places. Uh, so now I've been at Pythian for the last couple of years. Two-thirds of our 350 employees are work from home uh, in 29 different countries. So we've got quite a bit of experience in working with remote teams and remote people. Um, and it's kind of been an interesting culture change. Uh, I'm Mark Embriaco. I am currently the Vice President of Technical Operations at DigitalOcean, uh, where my team, it's actually interesting, this is the, the first job I've had in a while where I actually have anyone who works for me that is in the office, um, rather than being entirely distributed. And I, I like that word distributed instead of remote, because I think it sets the right tone. I think remote implies that, uh, that the people that, are, that work from home are somehow separated from the rest of the business in a way, and I don't like that term. Um, I use it all the time, but I still don't like it. Uh, I've worked at a bunch of places that have done remote since 1999. Remote, see, I just said it. I, I've been remote and distributed. I've worked at a bunch of distributed companies since 1999. Um, companies like 37 Signals, who, who thought so much about it that they wrote a book. Um, Heroku, GitHub, a bunch of companies that sort of famously do distributed teams. So, so I have a lot of thoughts about that we can get into. 
I'm Mike Rumbetsy, um, the VP of Technical Operations at Etsy.com. Uh, I started with distributed teams that happened to be remote, um, or vice versa. Uh, many, many, you know, about 10, 12 years ago when it still wasn't that prevalent. You know, most people had to go into the office and they had to actually work. So very similar to Bill being the one or two people who actually could work remotely. And as a consultant in a managed service space when I started, um, I was one of those people who was able to work with many multiple clients and, and learn some lessons. Etsy itself, um, today, we have offices all over the world. So we have remote cultures inside of remote offices that have other groups of people, as well as we have distributed employees anywhere from the East Coast to the West Coast to Scotland to India to Japan to Australia. Um, so those lessons of how people interact back with the HQ, if you will, which is located in Brooklyn, and how they actually um, will end up participating and scaling themselves, their career, their path, you know, and uh, contributing to the company are all things that certainly have been lessons learned since 2008 when I joined Etsy. So looking forward to talking about it. Great. Uh, so, so let's jump into um, companies making the transition to remote. This seems like one of the really key areas in, in you know, establishing the, the culture around it. Can you, um, I, I actually started in a company that was pre-remote, so I haven't experienced this, but if you've actually gone through this transition towards a remote or distributed workforce, uh, how did your company manage it? So we're going through it right now at DigitalOcean. <clears throat> um, when I joined the company, uh, the SRE team, which is one of the teams that reports to me, was entirely based in New York. There were only three people on the team. Uh, now there's 12, and there's still, well, there's, there's one more person in the office now. But every single other hire we've made has been distributed. And we're starting to go down that path on the engineering side as well. We have a number of engineering employees, and it's hard. Uh, if, if you have a company that has a culture around meetings in the office and around water cooler conversations and doesn't embrace asynchronous communication and doesn't really make an effort to be inclusive to the people that aren't in the office, it can be really hard. It's particularly challenging for the first distributed employees um, because, you know, they are, it's not that the people in the office are ex intentionally excluding them. They're just going about their business as normal. So they have to make, everyone has to buy into the idea. Everyone has to participate. The remote employees, the distributed employees have to pull communication out. They have to continue to push on uh, asynchronous communication. They have to, to kind of be the squeaky wheel to an extent. Yeah, you know, one of the interesting things that, that I noticed uh, in kind of the two different environments I've worked in is that you know, when you're that first couple of people that are doing it, there's an interesting cultural thing that happens. And like you said, it's unintentional, but it definitely happens. Like very typically at my, my last job, we had a handful of people that would work from home a couple of days a week. And very frequently you'd say, oh, did you talk to Mark about that? Uh, no, he's not here today. I'll just talk to him next week. Well, he's working, he's home, you can call him, you can get him on IM, like, you know, oh, no, no, I'll just talk to him next week. Like, and it would cause delays in projects or cause people to be left out of things. Um, one of the interesting things where I'm working now, where most of our staff is remote, and you know, my team, a good chunk of uh, my managers are here in the room, are Ottawa-based by our headquarters, but they also don't come into the office. And we've actually had, and this is a company where two-thirds of the service delivery team works from home, okay? I've had people actually make comments to me of, yeah, your team's never here in the office. Neither am I. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, but it, it's, it's interesting to see the cultural kind of divide that kind of happens um, when you've got people that are in an office. And I think we were talking yesterday, and sometimes it's even worse with remote offices because you, know, you have remote offices and remote employees, and the remote offices almost kind of form their own little subcultures um, where in our environment where most of our team is all remote, the amount of communication and interaction is much higher. Like, it's real-time communications. We're on video, you know, Google Hangouts all day. I've got guys that work our, in, you know, in Singapore, in Australia, that they'll actually jump into a video Hangout and just stay there together all night, like, as working their shift, just so they have somebody to talk to and somebody to communicate with. So, so how did you discourage the people that were doing these behaviors to change and, and, and make it better? Well, in my last organization, I didn't, which might have something to do with why I'm no longer there. <laughs> um, but you know, we don't see a lot of it in, in, at Pythian because 
again, so much of us are remote. Um, it, it's really hard to change the behavior of people who are in the office every day because they are used to just things being a certain way. They're used to being able to get up and walk over and just talk to somebody, trying to teach them that, hey, just I am me. Just you know, pick up the phone and call me. It's, it's kind of a hard transition to make. I actually do have an idea around that. That uh, you know, one of the one of the things that's been effective, at least in engineering type roles, has been to really enforce documentation. And if you if you tell people that everything you do has to be documented, and you're willing to accept the chat logs as documentation, uh, you can change behavior very quickly. Um, so there was a lot in there, but um, I think the first question that was asked was what. You know, how did you start with the transition and from being a non-distributed remote team culture to being one? And that was, that was really difficult for us in the beginning because when I came in in 2008, we had multiple engineers spread all throughout the US. And one of the underlying points, we, we keep saying culture or behavior, and really culture is defined by the behavior in a lot of ways of how companies interact with one another, that we had to define was we took a little bit different path. We, kind of took people who were remote and we had them all then centralized into Brooklyn to begin with. So we brought them all back into the HQ. And, and one of the reasons why we did that, and I think one of the foundational reasons um, or, or pieces for building a remote distributed culture is that you have to have relationships with people. You know, we're talking about relationship building and relationship management um, from individuals who are either ICs to managers, managers to managers, ICs to ICs, individual contributors is what I mean by ICs. And we had to build that foundational relationship between everyone on the team so that way there was a, there was a base to then build on. If someone would go away or, or move to Michigan, let's say, or San Francisco or wherever, they had that initial bond that they had formed. Um, and they, they felt comfortable picking up the phone and saying, hey, I'm going to go call Mark and say, Mark, where, where's this thing I asked you about yesterday, as opposed to I'm going to wait until he comes next month for his visit, delaying things. So laying the foundational um, relationship groundwork for how people interact is extremely important when you're doing any of the conversions from a non-distributed team to a distributed team. And making sure that the interactions are there for folks to build upon when they're not face-to-face. Because you do lose some level of human contact by not looking at people's faces. If I was doing this on the screen from another room, it'd be really different. It would, we could get the message across, but the relationship that we're building by us sitting up here, tired some of us, um, is, is, is what we're sharing together. And building that you know, next time, maybe it'll be different. But those were some of the things we did. So you're saying you made this part of your hiring process of the company, that you had like a, a workshop or training session at the beginning. So at the beginning, yeah, and we still do. We have an onboarding uh, process for sure. Um, <clears throat> and onboarding starts after the interviewing process. So we baked into the interviewing process or the, you know, the recruiting uh, side of it to look for folks who had the right qualities to be remote. That doesn't mean that every person we hired to be remote or someone who does move to be remote or distributed or work moves to another office, that doesn't mean that they have to have done it before. It helps, don't get me wrong, but there are certain qualities over communicating that's been said before. Um, we tend to find that our remote employees um, are very, very chatty um, because they're over communicating everything that they're doing. Um, it's kind of the reverse of a micromanager. Hey, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? It's like, hey, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And if you take it as annoying as a manager, it, it's going to be perceived incorrectly because you want them to over communicate. You want them to always be telling you what they're doing. Yeah, on that specific topic, the over-communicating, I think it can be a defense mechanism, right? The, the, uh, one of the things I've seen in companies, and I see it at an extent where I'm at now, is if you have a, a large group of people who are in the office obviously doing work, right? They're, their butts are in the seats every day, they're typing, things are happening on the screen. Uh, and you have people that are remote who may be as productive or more productive, but it's not as visible. Um, over-communicating, chatting, talking about what you're doing becomes a defense mechanism so people don't at wonder, you know, is this guy actually doing anything? Yeah, I think for, oh, God, that's loud. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start beatboxing here in a minute. So one of the things that was kind of interesting about TeamSnap is that we started remote and then kind of centralized a little bit uh, on the non-technical side so we didn't have to go through that transition of pushing people to be remote. But at 
the cur company I'm currently working at, my new job is CTO at a company called AdWorks in Durham, North Carolina. There's very much kind of that fear of remote, the, well, if we can't see them, if their butts aren't in the seat uh, from nine to five, are they really working? And so, you know, for me, I'm just like, well, that doesn't really matter. I mean, you judge people based on the work they're producing, whether or not they're accountable to themselves or accountable to their team. Um, and one of the things that we did at TeamSnap was we didn't care when you worked. Like, someone's like, hey, is Bob online? I don't know, not his parole officer. Did he get his stuff done? Uh, and that actually, for us, and you do have to find the right people. You have to find people who have that high degree of accountability, have that high degree of communication. But if you can find those people and they can work uh, in a distributed fashion, give them the freedom to work the way they want to work. Uh, one, one thing that I don't think we've kind of done a little level set here in the crowd, and um, as I said in my last talk, this isn't TV. I can see you, so I'll know if you're not paying attention. How many people here do have have worked uh, in a distributed fashion or currently work distributed? How many don't? How many does that question not apply to? It should be everybody. Uh, always one in the room. So, a lot, so it looks like a lot of people have distributed experience. Uh, so hopefully when we get into the somewhat more interactive portion, uh, we'll get to hear some of your stories too. Yeah, I think you brought up a really good point about building that initial connection. So one of the things that we do, and we've experimented with this quite a bit over the 16 years the company's been around, is we have an onboarding process as well. And, and also during the screening and the interviewing process, like you said, they don't necessarily have to have work from home abilities or have done it in the past, but you can kind of sense there's personality aspects that you can sense. And I find that people are either really, really good at it or really, really horrible at it. Like, you know, and, and there's a couple of dysfunctions you'll see. Either people work way too much because they feel like they have to prove themselves to make themselves relevant, or they're just way too easily distracted. Um, a couple of the things that we do is, you know, we bring every new employee to our headquarters in Ottawa for three weeks. It doesn't matter if you live in Australia, it doesn't matter if you live in Canada, it doesn't matter if you live in the UK. We have offices in like six different countries. Um, we experimented for a while of bringing them to their nearest office and that didn't really work. The only thing that's actually worked is actually bringing them to our headquarters for three full weeks. Their team lead has to be there for at least one of those weeks and a, a member of their team has to be there with them. Um, and we found that that has a dramatic impact on retention in the first six months. Why didn't it work to bring them into the closest remote office? Well, the reason it didn't work is because typically bringing them into the closest remote office, they're mixing with other team members that are part of the organization, but sometimes, you know, the Australia office is all Oracle DBAs, mm. right? So if I bring a SQL Server guy there to be onboarded and taught about the company, he's never really going to work with those guys again. You know, they'll form a relationship, but they don't work together on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it's it's we find it's really important to mix them with. So this is this is some this is actually kind of an artifact of the way that your company is organized, which probably a lot of companies have a similar organization. But if there was a more distributed workforce at those offices, then maybe it would work. Well, I think that particular thing is an artifact that Oracle is our largest practice. Right. Um, I've got team members in probably ten or twelve countries at this point, um, but I don't have any at any of our offices. Um, in fact, I think we only have mostly Oracle people at our other offices, maybe a couple SQL Server folks. Okay. But Oracle is our largest group by far. Cool. Um, by the way, we, we'd like this to be interactive. So if you have questions to ask, please use the microphone so that everybody in the room can hear you. And it is being recorded, so um, the people outside of the room will be able to hear you too and, and understand the context of the question. Thank you. Andrew. So one of the... Um one of the things that's come up, which you've sort of indirectly um, attacked, is I find there's, there's sort of a very weird um, barrier to just calling people. And I think one of the things that, you know, particularly as I work at a major telecommunications company, <laughs> one of the things I find weird is that I'll have people who say, well, listen, I'll cue you, which is sort of like an, an, um, an, an instant messaging thing. And, and they said, well, but I'm not on cue right now because it doesn't work with Macs. Um, and, and I said, why don't you just call me? You have a phone. And they, oh, well, no, that's too much bother. And I said, like, what? <laughs> so I think one of, the, one of the things that I've found as I've moved to a new team where I was the only remote person um, is that I get one-on-one -on -one and I just get on the phone with those people. I'm pretty aggressive on the phone. I don't mind spending six hours a day on the phone. Get a good high-quality 
wireless headset and you're good to go. But um, I just found that I would work with people in my team on a project where I'd be on the phone with them a lot. And you know, and after a few hours, you can grind them down and it's just no longer a problem for them to get on the phone to you. <laughs> but, but you know, initially it is an issue, but it takes, you know, sort of tens of hours of phone time before they get to the point where, oh yeah, I can just call Andrew. You know, it, it's okay, it'll just work. And so, but I think that initial sort of barrier just seems absurdly high for no obvious reason. Anyway. God, I hate the telephone. Uh. See, and I, I, lo I love the telephone. Yeah. I'm, with, I'm with Andrew. Yeah. And, and I, I'm a firm believer that if you can't physically be in front of someone, your voice gives you, whether it's a video conference or a phone call, I prefer phone. Um, you can hear tones and inflections in someone's voice to read a little bit better than just reading an email, right? So, so medium of communication, right? Email typically is much slower of a response. It's completely impersonal. And, and you know, chatting on IRC or HipChat or whatever, or you know, Twitter DMs, whatever you use, Gchat, doesn't matter, Skype, completely impersonal. Having a conversation with someone and being on the phone is, in my world, extremely important. So I have two remote folks who are in London, and I have another one who is in San Francisco, someone who's in Michigan, and what happens is I'm up very early in the morning and I'm on the phone with my London guys when I'm, when I'm driving in in the morning. Right? I've got my headset and I'm checking in with them every single day. And then when I drive home, I'm talking with my San Francisco remote guys because it's part of, I, I feel this way, it's part of my job to also be an over-communicator like they are with their work, but to over-communicate with them about what I'm experiencing in the office. And for me, phone is the, is, is the right way to do that, right? Because of some of the, the inflections, the tones, of being able to read people's voices. Sometimes, you know, you're right. There, there is a bit of a higher bar, but once people get used to you kind of calling or understanding that they can call you at any point in time, that barrier falls very, very quickly, and it's actually a really effective way of communicating with distributed teams. Mark never picks up my call, but he knows what I'm doing. He's like, no, I'm not going to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, the tone and inflection does get lost in text-based mediums. Um, when I say I don't like the phone, I actually don't like the telephone. We rely fairly heavily on Google Chat, and for us, I think having the, the picture along with the sound was pretty important. So, you know, the same point kind of remains. At the same time, we didn't use Google Hangouts as much as probably we could have, because we ended up hiring people and building people who really enjoyed kind of the asynchronous text-based communication. And because we got people together frequently enough that they knew that, hey, you know, Wade's always sarcastic and Emily's always, you know, pretty bitter and, you know, Steve's, you know, happy all the time or whatever, you know, when people were, uh, I know, happy? What the hell? We're sysadmins. But um, we could be happy if, uh, if we're not talking to people. But... If, if, as long as everyone's kind of on the same page about communicating and they know, they and the rest of their team know how best to kind of keep everyone in sync, it's kind of what works for your team. Like telephones, people would not, in the team that we built, would not be big fans of telephones, but they were all about them some chat. Um, and other folks, of course, have different uh, experiences. Yeah, I mean, my team's, we very, very heavily uh, rely on Google Hangouts video communications. I probably spend at least two thirds of my day in a video conference with somebody, from one-on-one -on -one communications over to you know, 10 of us in a conference talking about you know, having meetings and such. Um, my team also very heavily relies on group chats. So uh, we have an XMPP server that we all use because we were told that we couldn't use IRC anymore for whatever reason. Um, but we all have XMPP chats, and those, those chats, like you said, they're very impersonal. So they tend to be more operational in nature, like the team members are communicating about things that are going on, okay, I did this, I did that. Um, but all of our actual discussions and stuff are, are happening over video, and then we fall back to um, telephone. It's kind of the fall back to the video chat. It's funny, we did this thing last year where they were doing alternative communications days. It was an HR initiative, and they were encouraging people to use best, you know, different and maybe better methods of communicating because a lot of our other teams, you know, were still using conference bridges and WebExes and you know that sort of stuff for collaboration. And meanwhile, my guys are all using Google Hangouts and you know shared Google Documents for everything. Like marketing will send us a document they want collaboration on, and it's got a word attachment. And they're like, put your comments in and send it back, and we're like, well, that's ridiculously inefficient. Um, so, you know, it, it is, I think the video portion of it is even better than the telephone because 
not only do you get the voice inflections, but you can see facial inspections and body language is well known to be a huge, huge, you know, communicative even more than voice. So, uh, so we we don't uh, we work differently than you guys. It's interesting. Um, you, you said that the the chat was very operational and a lot of the the sort of decision making and everything else happened in in chat, we, we kind of take the other approach. We like to use chat for all of the communication, if possible. Uh, we do have a scheduled Google Hangout every single day for a stand-up, so we see each other's faces and we talk. And we upgrade bandwidth to a Hangout if we need to, if the communication isn't happening effectively in chat for some reason. But when we do that, we like to record those, too, so that people who weren't there can take advantage of it. Um, because, again, I think I think one of the, the strongest keys to having effective distributed teams is embracing asynchronous communication and accepting what feels inefficient. I can't get an answer to my question right now. I need to go interrupt someone so I can get an answer to my question right now. That's not necessarily important. Stop and think about whether you actually need, is it actually a blocker to get the answer to that question right now? Uh, would I go over and tap this person on the shoulder right now because I need, what I, my question is more important than what they were working on. A quick follow up. How do you, um, I mean, you record these, right? You said, how do you index them and make them available for people? So that's a great question. We don't record everything. We record uh, things that feel like they're important, um, feel like there is use, there's going to be useful content that other people need. Uh, and we, we just link them in our documentation and our wiki. Yeah, I, I'm totally on board with the async stuff. I mean, at Team Snap, the culture of the company was built in the chat room. And that's where kind of everyone's kind of shared experiences came in. Ben's super patient. Yeah, Ben's really patient. Hey, do you want to give it a try? You want to ask me a question? Oh, failed. Uh, Mark, you already kind of touched on this. I was curious what you guys do for team meetings. Um, I find that the stand-up idea, make it quick, make it short, make everyone stand up, works really well for people in offices. But at least for my remote teams, generally that's the only real socialization you kind of get during the day. I personally don't think that, that chat is a great mechanism. We use it all day long. Um, but there's not the same kind of connection. The other thing is people are, some people are happy, some people are sad, some people are snarky, and all that inflection does not come across. You know, did you get that done? Oh yeah, I totally got that done. Wait, oh, it's incorrectly. wait, incorrectly. did you, right. wait, are you being sarcastic or did you actually get it done? Um, so team meetings tend to be good and I tend to let my team meetings go kind of long because I want people to, to not just get it out there but have a sense of what everyone is doing. So how do you guys do team meetings? Uh, I agree with you. God, this one is so loud. I agree with you about just letting them go. Uh, one of the things we did at Heroku with the our stand-ups, stand-up, nobody stood up. We were all on Google Chat uh, or Google Hangout, but we would we would talk about sort of the business items, and then we would just leave the Hangout open for hours on end at times, um, and people would just go on about their day. We don't do that at DigitalOcean so much, but we do have much longer stand-ups than most of the other teams do. Um, and it's a socialization opportunity as much as anything else. Uh, so at Etsy, we, um, the operations team, which include, is open to other folks um, as well to come for our, our meeting is once a week. Um, the meeting is set in a way that there's an agenda, um, but the agenda is easily changeable, so it's kind of open, but there are some set things that we'll do. So once a week, everyone will be on video. V-I-D-Y-O is what we use at Etsy, video. Um, and they'll all dial in, everyone is in the room. Um, I'm, and the agenda goes on call report, so that way we have high visibility across the entire team of if someone was on call, what actually happened, followed by any launches that are happening that we should all know about, whether it's on the site, whether it's we're spinning up a new Hadoop cluster, whatever it is, uh, announcements. And then we will have um, basically show and tell or demos where people within the team will show the show and uh, demo what they've been working on. And that actually gives us a pretty decent way of drumming up questions to then create more interactions after the meeting for people to then have more questions or go talk to someone. Um, but we, we have it set once a week like that. At TeamSnap, the way we did it was every day when someone came online, they would send out an email stand up to the engineering group. So there would be what I worked on yesterday, what I'm working on today, and any blockers. So that kind of happened in a more asynchronous manner across the entire engineering organization to kind of give you visibility into what everyone's working on. And if you know there's someone who wasn't in your group but you still want to keep track of them, you could just read their stand-up email whenever it was convenient for you. And then the sub-teams that we had, the engineers divided up into, 
they would have kind of video hangouts a couple times a week, standing, and then if a blocker had come up that really impacted what they were working on, they would call kind of an impromptu meeting, but we didn't have kind of a daily video stand-up. It was, again, more of kind of an async email sort of thing. So at Pythian, what we do is our teams are constructed in a follow-the-sun sort of way, so having daily stand-ups is quite challenging considering there's always somebody that it's 3 in the morning for. Um, so my team managers are pretty much all North American based, as are my principal consultants. So we have a daily stand-up kind of of our leadership group every morning. Um, it's less than 30 minutes. There's about five or six of us that attend. And it's just, you know, the typical stand-up. What are you doing? What are you stuck on? You know, what did you accomplish yesterday sort of stuff. And then we have a weekly kind of leadership meeting where it's an hour and a half and each person gets 15 minutes to present and kind of get everybody up to speed on what's going on in their individual group. And then we also have a, a lunch video hangout uh, every Friday for an hour where we just sit at our desks and eat our lunch and there's no agenda. It's mostly social. Sometimes we'll have a topic, but sometimes we won't um, because it, our other meetings are so structured it doesn't give us much socialization and we don't get that sitting in the lunchroom experience that, that you get from an office, so we tried to reinvent it that way. It seems to work pretty well. Um, at the team levels, what they do is they have... Um, we run four shifts typically, or we try to, so there's always some good overlap between shifts. Um, but even when we don't accomplish that, we have handoff tickets. So basically any engineer that's working has to document, okay, these are the incidents that came up while I was on shift, this is what we did about it, and then the person taking over uh, will review that. And then the teams themselves, the team managers host a weekly meeting. Um, my group, now a couple different of the practices at Pythian do this differently, but this is the way my group does it. Um, they have a weekly team meeting that everybody attends, and they rotate the time of it from time to time because it's always going to suck for somebody. Um, so we try to make it not suck for the same person all the time. So. <clears throat> so a couple comments and then a, a specific question. Um, first off, on the distributed versus remote, to me those are actually very different things. I worked six years for uh, a corporation where I was on a distributed network team. Every member of the team reported to an office every day, but we had a couple people, East Coast, US, one West Coast, one in India, one in Prague. It was distributed team, but we were all in the office, whereas I'm now working full-time remote. I work at home every day, but one of the things we've done that kind of helps those remote people stay connected is we've made the assertion that those people will travel on a regular basis to an office. So right now, every five weeks, I travel to our main, quarter, main headquarters office, and I spend a week there. Don't Helps you, that we have the budget for that, et cetera, so that that can get expensive. But don't you find that the tools that you need to, to foster the communication is the same, whether it's distributed or remote? Uh, a little bit different, because as a distributed person, I have coworkers that I work, that I can just talk to, that they may not be on my team, but I'm, interacting with them, I can, you know, as a network guy, I can talk to the SA guys and, and be aware of the sorts of things that are going on. So there's the natural collaboration of an office space still happens. You don't have to go out of your way to do those sorts of things. That was the distinction for me. Um, so the, the question I had was specifically around tools and collaboration because uh, I'm seeing things like the, the comment of, of asynchronous communication is great. Well. It is, but it's not. The problem I run into is I'll write a design doc or a roadmap proposal and I'll send it out in email to the team and a week later I got to send a ping going, hey, nobody gave me feedback. And, you know, because I'm not in an office so I'm not kind of poking people in person. Same is, is true a little bit about um, chat. We use Slack, we use Hangouts. I'm not finding Hangout scales to stand-ups. So I'm trying to figure out what can we do to change our stand-ups now that we have more remote people, hangouts just don't seem to be scaling quite right. The, the comment of email stand-ups is making me actually thinking about chat-based stand-ups. Send one line to this channel every day. That's your stand-up report. And then as long as everybody's reading that channel, it's not, oh, I didn't read those emails today. You read that channel, you saw everybody's report. If there was something that was relevant, you take it over to another channel and talk about it. So is I, I kind of have a question back about um, the I'll send a, an email out and then a week later I'll have to be, oh, hey, 
is anybody taking a look at this because I'm not in an office? Um, I kind of disagree, but I want to understand a bit more of what the expectation of sending that email out is for you. Is it that everyone is not working on something else and that that email is going to be read in a certain time frame with a response? Or is it if you were in an office and not working remotely, would you not have sent that email and then instead just had the conversation with someone? Why shouldn't you just have the conversation with them instead of sending the email even being remote? I'm not sure I have an answer to that. <laughs> uh, uh, so I think, you know. The, the point is, I don't think that the medium of communication that you're picking is dependent upon being in an office or not, right? If you, if you need to have a conversation about a, a document that you're sending out, Maybe email isn't the best option. Maybe picking up the phone, maybe jumping on a call, something. But I don't think that being remote or being distributed or not is dependent upon an office for getting communication between people. Yeah, you know I, I, mean? I, think, I think for me, it's that the poke reminder of, hey, can you get me feedback on this? In an office setting is so much easier to just, you know, as you're walking past someone, hey, did you read that? And, it, and it's more, more ad hoc as opposed to I think, when you're poking something on an email, it feels like, hey, you know, I really am waiting for you well, on this. I, I think that, that he's got a point is that it might, it's not necessarily a remote versus office problem, but it's, it's a problem because I find the same thing um, whether I'm dealing with the, my team members that are in the office or I'm dealing with the team members that aren't in the office. A lot of times what will happen is we do everything with Google Docs because they're collaborative and um, much easier to... Uh, share and work together. And what I've found is if I do the same thing you're saying, I send out an email and say, hey, can everybody go in and put some comments to this document? Sometimes it works out great. And then a couple of days later, I go in there and there's a lot of good comments and feedback and edits and stuff like that. And sometimes a week later, I'll look back and nobody's even opened it. Um, and then, so usually what I'll do is I'll, what I've done now is I'll send out an email saying, hey, can everybody take a look at this again a chance? And next Friday at our lunch, at our lunch meeting, we're going to talk about it. So at the very least, there's a, there's a deadline set. And I know that even if they haven't touched it, right, set the expectations. And even, I know even if they haven't touched it, we're going to work on it collectively at lunch, whether it takes five minutes or the whole hour. Yeah, getting to your question about tools, uh, for us, the tools that we really kind of use to keep our distributed culture going were Slack. Highly endorse that. Very good product. We had an internal blog where groups and teams were expected to kind of post on a weekly basis what they'd been working on and, you know, just silly stuff, birthdays and cat pictures and stuff like that. Google Hangouts if we needed the face-to-face -face stuff, email for stuff that was a little less urgent, uh, GitHub issues for working on our code. Google Docs is an amazing thing for collaboration, assuming everyone logs in and does it. And then just kind of addressing your question about Google Hangouts not really scaling for stand-ups. What we found was that we, when we started hitting kind of a Google Hangout limit on stand-ups, our teams were probably way too big and we needed to kind of focus a little bit more because, you know, getting a stand-up with 10, 12, 15 people in there really went nowhere. A stand-up with five or six people, we found a lot more effective. And another thing to point out is, like, we use Google for all of our email, calendaring, everything. Um, and they recently changed it so Google Hangouts can actually support up to 15 video uh, participants as long as you have to, it's a special feature that you have to enable on the domain and it has a marginal cost to it. But we did that because sometimes we'll break that 11 person mark. But yeah, I agree. Like a stand up has 20 people in it. Well, that's just normal group dynamics though. Once you get beyond, you know, seven people, the effectiveness of, you know, group dynamics tends to break down. Yep. One of the other tools that we put together, um, instead of um, in a stand-up, everyone standing up and holding whatever ceremonial piece of you know, tchotchke stuff they have to talk um, and give their update, I did this, I did this, I did this, um, it's every responsibility of every ops person to put in what they've worked on the previous week into an open source tool that we built called Ops Weekly. It's on our GitHub. Um, Lori Dinas wrote it with the intent that it is everyone's responsibility before they walk into that weekly meeting that we have to go and read other people's updates on the train so they have an understanding so we're not wasting time inside of the meeting listening to everyone else say, well, I did this last week and I did this, I did this. If there's a problem or they have a question, now we can target in on the meeting time if there's an announcement or something like that. So we, we built that tool that also integrates in with uh, Nagios and on-call alerting, signal to noise ratio, stuff like that. Speaking of signal and noise. Yeah, there you go. I guess I, my time's up. But yeah, that, that, kind of, uh, that kind of process I think is great, and that's kind of what we use our 
daily email stand-ups to, to function. Like, you know, read that stuff, and if you've got questions, if we need to discuss further, let's grab it. Otherwise, you know, let's not spend meeting time doing something that we could have read. So far, a lot of the discussion has been on the more uh, technical aspects and team efficiency. I'm just wondering if you could touch a bit on the more um, cultural and organizational, like social aspects about the remote work. Uh, what kind of programs you have to um, foster that sort of, um, you know, making the, the remote workers feel a part of the organization with, uh, you know, they miss out on company lunches and, uh, you know, uh, provided food and drinks and things of that nature. Um, disclaimer, I'm a member of Bill's team, so I, you know, he, I, I'm aware of what we provide, but uh, if he could kind of just touch on that a bit, and then I'm curious what other uh, similar programs you may have. Well, yeah, I think you're pretty aware of what our programs are. Um, <laughs> I hope, I, I hope. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, some of the things that, that we do as a, as a company organizationally, and I have no idea what's going on in the next room, <laughs> but um, aliens are invading it or something. Um, but um, yeah, so some of the things we've done as a culture and as an organization, you know, I mentioned some of the stuff we did as a team to have, you know, our weekly lunch and our meeting cadences and stuff like that. But some of the other stuff that we've done is like, we do fun social things that HR generally promotes. Like um, we have... Um, weekly, uh, monthly drawings for remote workers that basically will say, you know, hey, if you're working in an office, people bring in donuts a couple times a month or people bring in a cake or stuff like that. You don't get any of that when you're, when you're working from home. You know, a coffee and stuff like that is provided. You don't get any of that when you're working from home. So we do a remote draw um, where we pick a name uh, every month and they get $50 and it's a social networking thing. They have to take pictures of what they bought with it and, you know, share it with the group. Um, we also have, um, you know, programs where we um, try to bring everybody back for mashups about every three years or so. Um, we're so diverse, it's hard to do it with everybody very frequently, but every three years or so, we bring people to their nearest office so they can meet up with different members of their team. We try to coordinate things like that. Um, and we do things like Geek Day, because, um, you know, we're all computer geeks, so we will, um, we will often, um, you know, People dress up in costume or, or whatever, and we'll have a contest to see who wins, and there'll be a prize and stuff like that. When I did this, I found there were some compensating effects. Like, sure, you don't get to do some of the in-office things, but you get some additional benefits as well. Like, just, you know, a lot of additional flexibility. If you have family, you've got a little bit more family time. If you mean you like doing run, your laundry while you're on mute during exactly, a meeting? Exactly. Yeah. You can you can run <laughs> errands. You can you can walk on the treadmill. You can you can work from the hammock in the yard. I mean, there's just a lot of additional flexibility benefits that you do get that might compensate depending on your situation for you know the lack of in office coordination. Uh, so we, for anyone who is in the U.S. Uh, on the ops team, they are able to come once a month if they want to, once every other month. And they can spend a week in the office, which is typically their socialization time. Um, I, they don't do a lot of work when they come. They're mostly just talking with everyone inside the team, outside the team. Uh, international folks can come once a quarter. Um, we fly them over. Um, in addition, other programs we have is that um, Etsy and our remote offices all have the same programs, if you will. So we have Etsy, where we all go skiing as a company. We have a Halloween party. We have a holiday party. Um, we have our summer party. Um, we have uh, um, ET every Tuesday and Thursday, which is our in-house um, food. And all the other remote offices also do ET every Tuesday and Thursday, um, in which it's all locally sourced food, organic, um, uh, supporting local businesses in terms of our values and impact. So those are some things that we do. Now, as far as how remotes feel, like people working at home and not in remote offices, um, they're actually able to go ahead and buy some lunch for themselves, expense it, and be part of it if they want to. So, um, but they typically, when they come into the office, experience this at least once a month or once a quarter. So they're continually doing that. Yeah, you guys are adorable. <laughs> uh, I do. I've been to Etsy, and it's adorable. Um, no two tables are the same, seriously. That's actually true, yeah. Um, yeah, I like to bring my teams in quarterly. In fact, uh, I'm flying home tomorrow morning and getting on a plane Saturday morning to go to New York 
where my team will be, and we're going to a football game Sunday. And uh, we like to bring the entire team in, and we like to bring our engineering teams in. We like to bring all of our distributed employees in uh, at least quarterly. Uh, and I, I've specifically built budget for that. If we were 350 people, it would be a lot harder. Uh, but we did the same thing at GitHub with 200 people. Uh, we only did it twice a year because, again, it's very costly, but it's worth it. Yeah, at TeamSnap, we would get everyone in the company. Uh, we even brought the, our one uh, Croatian sysadmin in this time. We get everyone together for a week offsite, uh, Steamboat Springs, Colorado. That was kind of our social time. We talked to a good game about, you know, having smaller teams get together more often, but it never seemed to happen. That's, an, that's something that I kind of wish we had pushed on a little bit more. Get, get the developers who are working on this problem together for a few days in one city or you know, get the support team together for a few days in another city. I think we probably would have been a little better off if we pushed harder on that. Yeah, I mean, one of the other things that I do with my leadership group, a lot of whom are here today, um, is I'm in Ottawa. Like I said, I live in New Hampshire in the middle of the woods. Um, but I'm in Ottawa at a corporate office where most of them reside, or are at least close to. Uh, they're all Canadian-based, at least once a month, typically, uh, at least every six weeks. Um, and once a quarter, we get together and have like a whole day off-site meeting where we you know, go through kind of strategic planning and things like that, and team member review, top grading, all that good stuff. And then we do a social event. You know, we go out and see a movie. There's not an awful lot to do in Ottawa, unfortunately. So we see, we see a lot of movies. Yeah. Um, I, see, I see more movies in Ottawa than I do at home. Um, but, like, we take any opportunity we can get. Like, for example, we're all here. 90% um, of my leadership team here is less than one, you know, one guy is not. Um, and we're actually going to stay over until Sunday because we're all going out doing you know, touristy stuff on Saturday that, that, you know, I have a budget for and I'm paying for as part of the group because, you know, team building is, I think, even more important when you're remote because you don't have that camaraderie of sitting together at lunch or hanging around the water cooler or running out to your favorite sandwich shop or something. So, you know, you got to take the, the, the opportunities to get and the times that you get and try to make the most out of them. I just wanted to share a few things that have really worked for our company. We're kind of a large company, um, created AIM, all that other stuff. And so, you know, you think we'd have good communications. Um, we started remote working probably er, real early 2002, 2003 and stuff like that. And now I think it's gotten to the point where it's, it's really good and really efficient. And I think some of the things that have helped us is, um, polycoms and all our, our polycom video conferencing systems in all of our our rooms and that allows us to add, feel like we're there in the middle of the conversation um, using instant message of some type uh, whether it's aim or gtalk or sometimes we'll set up irc channels and we we share a lot of what we're working on in there or jokes or whatever um, google docs has been a godsend for us uh, we just absolutely love using that because and everyone we've finally gotten everyone to transition to using it we can make changes on the fly can be looking at the dock um, and the one thing our management has really done that I know a lot of us don't have any control over unless we're in management our our VP who's over all of tech ops um, a couple years ago uh, produced something called the remote worker swarm it's kind of like what you guys were talking about, where they fly everyone in once a year from all over the world. And we have a week there where we're in classes, we're doing things, we're going out to lunch, um, and they're doing team building exercises. Um, he's really shown and embraced remote working, so the remote workers he has are producing. They're not just tell you I'm working, they're actually, they're actually uh, tele teleworking, so they're actually doing the right thing, so I think, the biggest thing for us, though, is, is those polycoms or hangouts or whatever we're going to use in the future to talk to each other and see each other. Just seeing the inflection on, on people's faces, and, or inflection, hearing the inflection in their voices and seeing their faces helps a lot. There's a lot of things you just can't get from a chat because there's still no sarcasm font. So just wanted to share a few of those things that are working for us. Awesome. You know, I, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about the challenges of remote, but we haven't really talked about why, if, if it's harder, if it's more challenging, and it is, why do we do it? Um, and I, I, think, I think it's useful to kind of level set there. Um, for me, it's simply that I want to work with the best people I can find, period. Uh, and I don't care where they live. 
and I, I find it to be a tremendous recruiting advantage. Um, I, I can't tell you how many how many times I talk to people and they're saying, God, I just I can't find people to work. Like, well, that's because you want them to live within, you know, a, a, a one hour radius of where you are. I got resumes. I, I don't have enough slots for all the people I can find right now. Um, so I, I, having access to the best talent, the best people you can find, no matter where they live, uh, is a huge benefit. No, Mark's absolutely right on that. I mean, if you, it's, it's tight out there finding talented technology people and any advantage you can give yourself in finding great people. I mean, our chief architect at Team Snap uh, lives in Saginaw, Michigan. You know what's in Saginaw, Michigan? Not a lot. Uh, him and his family, and he was just absolutely thrilled that he didn't have to work for Frankenmuth Insurance. He could work for a great tech company and stay in Saginaw. And so, you know, he's totally bought in. He's passionate about the company. Uh, it just gives us better employees. And be, I think having a distributed team puts the onus on them to to be responsible, and I think that people take that and they run with it, and you end up with, with great people who go above and beyond because you're willing to give them the flexibility to you know, live their life like a responsible adult. That, that, for us, I think, was one of the biggest things that got us great talent was you know, like, hey, you know, if you want to take a nap or if you want to go out with your kids or if you want to work from the beach for a week, we don't care. We care what you get done and if you're accountable to your folks. And, you know, that's a lot easier to do when I don't feel the pressure of sitting there and looking like, are you at your desk? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we have some of the same reasons that Mark does. Like, you know, our founder decided 15 years ago that, you know, one of our company memes is that we try to t hire the top 5% of people in our industry space. And um, we learned something very quickly is that they don't want to move to Ottawa. It's because the sins are horrible this year. <laughs> yeah, like, you, you know, it, it's... You, 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 if you want to work with the best people, they don't want to move to wherever your closest office is unless it's someplace like Hawaii, then maybe. Um, but like, and the other thing is, it, it's a great, for the right people, and kind of what Mike was saying earlier, is to the right people, it, it's, it's a great benefit, right? Like for me, I find working from home a lot less stressful. But I'll be honest, when I first started working from home full time, you know, when I started the job at Pythian, it was incredibly stressful because I, you know, my old job, I worked from home three days a week, maybe two to three days a week, but all of my crew was Boston based. So at six o'clock at night, seven o'clock at night, they're all home. So the amount of engagement I get is typically just for emergencies and stuff. But one of the challenges I had was that what was happening was I had people that were working for me all around the globe. So I was finding that I was working 24 seven. So you have to learn to, you know, okay, I'm done for the day. You know, page me if it's an emergency. Don't look at group chat because you're just gonna stay up till three in the morning. But it's a huge benefit if you can manage it properly um, to an employee because it can very well help work-life balance if you can manage it. It can either completely destroy your work-life balance or it can make it completely awesome. There's not a lot of middle ground. <laughs> when you work at home, you're always at work. Well, similar to that, I, I'd add, and I just want to like rock star this thing. Um, I don't know about you guys in other parts of the country or other parts of the world, but in the Silicon Valley, the everyone's moved to the kind of the Google model, where all the cubes are taken out, all the offices are gone. We have these long tables that look like they're from Pink Floyd or 1984 videos, you know, where everyone it's all super collaborative, which is another way of saying you have zero privacy and you have you have distractions galore. And everyone's working off their laptops because we can't be big boys with real computers with like lots of screens where we can actually see what the fuck we're doing. But anyway, so it's horrible. So I'm finding that I don't I hate working in the office. It's it, working in an office is very similar to working in a Starbucks these days, right? Uh, except in Starbucks, they don't distract you as much. So, but I'm a Unix system administrator, and we've gone like almost an hour without talking about anything terribly technical. So I'm getting all kind of kind of. Uh. So security. How do you deal with security for your employees? And, and that also, I think, applies somewhat to the office because doing security at Joint, I kind of made the point, like, our production environment is not in the office. We don't have these sacred virtual networks that have direct links into the office. So as far as I'm concerned as a security officer at Joint, the office might as well be at Starbucks. I don't care. It has no special privilege, privilege whatsoever. So how do you guys handle VPN, secure links, auth, all that kind of stuff for remote workers? Uh, so we have VPN, two-factored. 
for everything. So anyone, it, whether you're in the office or whether you're in a Starbucks, it, they're treated the same way. And that just level sets it, which is nice. Um, we have lots of um, security monitoring around our VPNs, around access to different things. Um, there's tons of great talks of how we do security at Etsy that are out there between Zane Lackey, who used to be there, and Rich Smith, who's there now. Um, but basically, we have VPN. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty standard. You know, We just approach it as a coffee shop. Everything is. Every office is. There's nothing special about one office from the other. Um, we don't have in the office any uh, like file servers or centralized you know, systems, those all live inside of our data center. And that's, that, that is then able, once you're VPNed in, to have a single point for management, whether it's policy-based routing or whatever we do. So. Yeah, I actually don't think it's very much different from offices to distributed teams, right? Uh, especially considering almost everyone's work computer is a laptop, right? You have the same you have mobility concerns, even if everybody's in the office, because they're taking their computer home. So you need to do things like enforce full disk encryption, and um, maybe you have some endpoint security policies. Maybe you don't. Um, VPNs with two-factor auth, all the, the kind of normal things that you would expect. And the coffee shop network is absolutely the way to go. Don't treat your office network as trusted in any way, because <laughs> someone will come in off the street and plug in an Ethernet cable, and all of your thoughtful security just went away. Yeah, I mean, that's a big challenge uh, for us at Pythian because obviously we're connected to hundreds of clients' networks with, you know, anything from DBA access to full root access to their entire infrastructure. Um, so managing remote employees is, is a really big thing from a security. We have a whole security department. One of the things that we're actually doing is we're actually moving away from a VPN um, because what we had in the past was, you know, two-factor, standard two-factor authentication, VPN, you get connected, and then from there you can get to whatever jump box you're assigned to, and then you can get to whatever clients you're supposed to be able to get to. Um, but what we're doing is we're actually, we built a product actually called Adminiscope, um, which is a privileged access management system. It's kind of a big terminal server that, you know, you can grant different rights, different user accounts and such, and it records everything, all the screens, all the sessions, everything. Um, so our our DBAs and our sysadmins connect through that to get to client networks. And it's all logged, it's all recorded, um, and we're only using VPN for, you know, some internal stuff like Tableau and, and different reporting systems and stuff like that. And then the rest of our, you know, ticketing system is all publicly available where we've got, well, to our, to our yeah, it's on the internet. Uh, our ticketing system's on the internet and, you know, we're going to be putting two-factor authentication on that too. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're moving towards trying to make it easier for people to work it, with their own equipment because it's, especially when you're dealing with hundreds of sysadmins and DBAs, like trying to have an IT organization that tells them what they can and can't run on their machines doesn't work real good. Trust me, they've tried. <laughs> so, so last year, I'll interject and then we'll go to your question. Last year, uh, Google had a paper on how they do remote auth, and they've also gotten rid of VPNs and two-factor, and they've like just totally integrated in their entire structure of their organization, so you can have your machine anywhere you auth once, and you basically have access to the things that you need access to. It's an interesting one, and it is online, so you can you can go to the YouTube, you know, use Nick's Lisa channel, and you can watch it or you know review, you know, the presentation as well. Um, my name's Connie Lynn, and I used to work for Linden Lab. Um, so it was a distributed paradise, right? Um, and um, <clears throat> I have one tip, and then I have a question. And my tip is, you haven't lived until you've done phone shots. The whole rest of the team goes. Out, the whole rest of the team goes out to the bar. You call in the remote workers, and you all have your drinks right then. And I think I just lost my mic, but I have a loud voice, so I don't care. Um, my question is um, what do you do about um, <clears throat> failover when your, when your systems are, you know, when your systems have died, like, like your IRC server goes down or Gmail is having an outage and so you can't do Hangouts. Um, have you, what do you, do you have your systems in place for that to say like, oh, we'll fail over to Skype or we'll fail over to whatever so that we can all keep communicating or, um, you know, are you just sort of got it in your back pocket and hope it never fails and that you all just figure it out? So um, at Pythian, we actually put a lot of effort into that. Um, you know, our 
Administope system that I mentioned earlier that's used for all of our client access. We've got three of them located in different parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> and typically people connect to the one that's closest to them, but they also can connect to the others. So they very well know that, okay, if the one in the UK is down, I can connect to the one in Australia or the one in Canada or the one in the US. Um, and for um, our ticketing systems, we have failover procedures and we have DR sites and we're trying to get that to be more of a real-time thing than it is today. Um, for the chat systems, we do rely very heavily on Google, which thankfully doesn't go down that, all that often, but we also have other systems as well, like you know, our XMPP system is completely outside of Google. Um, so that typically isn't affected if Google is having outages. In general, we didn't have anything on a regular basis that was so urgent that a, an outage of a particular communication medium would would throw a wrench in anything. Uh, the times we had outages, like, oh, okay, well, I know what I'm working on, so I'll just catch up with that later. That being said, we had so many different modes of communication from email to Hangout to phone to docs to chat that if kind of the preferred way didn't work, there was usually a pretty obvious fallback for whatever sort of thing you were working on. We also do drills. Um, about just a month or two months ago, we did our first drill where they basically pretended the Ottawa office was destroyed. Um, so they sent an email out at like 4.30 in the afternoon and basically said, there's been a massive water main break near the Ottawa office. The office is completely flooded. No employees are permitted to enter the office until further notice, and they kept it shut that whole night and the whole day. It really sucked for the people that left their laptops on their desk when they went home that night, um, but they learned some important lessons. <laughs> Um, so, for failover, we try and run as many things active-active as possible. Um, but I think the lesson that we learned is if you have something that you're going to fail over, test that often to fail over to make sure that if it's you know an F5 and it's active standby, you fail that over. You want to make sure that those things are going to work in, in the middle of the night when you need them to. Um, communication was really interesting for us. I think a lot of what you're touching on is BCP, really, business continuity planning. And for us, we learned a lot of valuable lessons when Sandy hit the East Coast because most of our people are East Coast based and we lost power for upwards of 14 days. Half of New York was underwater. There wasn't, you know, it, I mean, literally the carousel right down from our office in Dumbo was literally almost covered. It was, it was insane. So the lessons that we learned out of that were um, we keep systems like video chat internal um, for us and then failover for that is either Skype or Google. For when IRC dies, we have multiple IRC servers that are syncing in multiple data centers, East Coast and West Coast, so we have some pretty nice redundancy built in. But in the event that it does go down, because it's not a matter of if, when it goes down, and we do need to communicate, say, company-wide, like during a Sandy, Sandy uh, taught us that we needed this tool. So we built a tool called Megaphone that has everyone's uh, information and will actually send uh, email to personal if Gmail is down, as well as Gmail and text message and SMS. So we built a couple of handy tools like that for, for mass communications. We run game day scenarios, very similar to what everyone else is saying. And we're now starting to talk about the zombie apocalypse, you know, with Ebola and all that stuff. Because what happens in Manhattan, you know, there's a confirmed case and they shut down everything. We go back to Sandy like. So we have a lot of lessons learned from when Sandy hit us on the East Coast. And we, we're building on those in order to properly understand what BCP is going forward. You really so. have to have your redundancy at a structural level, right? And, and New York is one of the actually lucky areas, I suppose, in that this is now required by the city to have business continuity plans. So we do, and, and it is also required to have yearly testing of those plans by, you know, shutting down something, you know, the network guys will go and just like, you know, unplug and just take the whole site offline and you have to test it out and make sure everything works. And so for things like VPNs, this is actually pretty easy because you can have multiple VPN concentrated wherever and people can just connect to whichever one they want. Uh, if a person is out at home, obviously that's a little bit of a challenge if their primary connectivity to the network is out, but they have cell phones usually, so you can get a hold of them. You can you know, get a set text messages or you know, tethering or, or, or whatever. And uh, one thing I wanted to say more about VPNs is in the last I'd say three years, the VPN clients on just about any device are so good. You, you get them on Android, you get them on iOS, you get them on all of the Linuxes. You can connect into those VPN concentrators no matter what your operating system or lack of operating system might happen to be. I, I had a situation the other day where I was on call and I was out somewhere and I forgot my computer and I like said, hmm, I wonder if I could do this. So 
I took my little, you know, Motorola phone and I fired up the VPN and I did the uh, BVNC client and I zoomed in so I could read the text and I like logged in the system and like fixed it right there and I'm like, hey, that'll all work in a pinch. Uh, just real quick, I think one of the uh, one of the important things here too is if you if you embrace asynchronous work, downtime of the tools becomes an inconvenience instead of a catastrophe, at least in the short term. You still need to have backup plans because sometimes it does become a catastrophe if you need it for incident response. Um, but you probably don't need all of your tools to be highly available all the time. So just understanding which tools are critical and when they're critical is a huge part of that. And, and another really important point is um, what Gene said this morning. Like, everybody has DR plans, and most people are too terrified to actually implement them, right? Like, you're, you're in the middle of a massive outage. You've been down for three hours, four hours, five hours. And meanwhile, people are saying, well, we have a DR site. Why haven't we failed over to it? And the IT guys are going, well, that's a lot scarier than this, <laughs> right? Like, if you're that scared of it, you should be doing it frequently and over and over and over until you're not scared of it. And it's going to hurt like hell the first few times, yeah. Hi, my name is Blair Zajac. I'm with Google. I'm actually on the Access SRE team, which does remote access. Um, so we're still rolling out the, the VPN deprecation. So we're trying to get everybody off of VPN. Um, and we've two-factor auth. We're actually moving past OTP to a challenge response. Uh, I don't know, maybe some of you have seen the the USB device that you can plug into your laptop. So um, we're going there. So that's actually, I believe, unfishable. So that and it's uh, a lot easier and quicker to use than grabbing a number off your device. Um, so anyway, if anybody wants to hit me up afterwards to find out what we're at, or there was at least a talk, as you mentioned. So that's pretty interesting. Um, we just feel like it's a you know it's the hard shell, the moat model which is really hard to protect against. So, and some of the stuff we developed is pretty cool and we're kind of thinking like, um, what's the next step for it? Do we open source it? Do we make a product out of it? Um, so that's kind of where our head's at right now. Um, to the meeting thing, there is actually, I'll pitch Google, we have a Chromebox for meetings device that you can actually stick in your meeting room. It integrates with Google Calendar, it's really cool. So you can actually book the device and you come up to it, your meeting, you just tap a button and it joins the Hangout. So um, we love it. I've used it at Sony Pictures, actually, where I was previously, but I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, we, we've actually got quite a few of them. We've put them in all of our conference rooms. Um, I agree with what these guys are saying. The camera on it could use a little work, but mm -hmm. for the most part, like. <laughs> but you think they can't hear you? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, the, the, uh, but they do work really well, yeah. May I? Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Pablo Casal. Um, I might be wrong, but as far as I know, uh, some big companies like Google, they don't allow remote work, or Microsoft, or um, Apple, for instance. Famously, Yahoo here recently. Yahoo? Yeah. And I would, I would like to know what are your thoughts regarding this uh, this matter. Uh, if, 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 if it's... Why these big companies don't allow it? Because if, if it is really great, and uh, all I'm hearing about is goes in this way, uh, I don't know, it's like a contradiction. What, what, what are your thoughts regarding this matter? I don't know why Yahoo did it in specific, but I can, my best guess is that it was a reaction to some sort of abuse internally where they didn't have the necessary processes to keep people involved because people can really abuse this, right? I mean, we, when we were at Global Crossing, we had one guy that literally disappeared for like three weeks. He didn't answer email, he didn't answer the phone. He was still getting a paycheck, which you know led to a question. It was like, hey, where is this guy? Because he used to have an IRC trigger that anytime anybody mentioned his name in IRC, he would get a page and he'd be like, be there whenever time. And then so he was gone for like three weeks. So, I mean, I can just imagine it's some sort of like, <clears throat> you know, talk back and say, yeah, we need to cut this out because we had abuse, which is how most regulations get said as well. Yeah, 
I think the, the answer to your question is that those companies are so large and they have the resources to, to bring in the talent that's remote and to compensate them enough to convince them to come to where they are. And also those companies are destination companies that people want to work at and are willing to make the sacrifice to move. Because again, it, it is harder to run distributed teams and to run remote teams. And if you, you have a place like a Google or a Facebook where people are willing to uproot their lives to come work there, then you don't have to make that sacrifice. Yeah, it certainly is something that is harder to scale, not impossible, and you know, I would say that the benefits of keeping larger organizations distributed are still there. But, you know, if you're if you're the bean counter and you're the you're the person who's next on the line, you know, the the old no one ever got fired from buying IBM, you know, no one ever got fired for bringing everyone in the office and making sure their butts were in the seat every day. It's uh, you know, I can I can see why it would be a challenge. At the same time, uh, I think Mark's absolutely right that, you know, you get the best talent you can wherever you can and you trust them to do a good job. And whether you're 10,000 people or 20 people, you're probably going to see the benefits. Another thing that's interesting is companies of that size, the way that they work is very similar to the way distributed teams work because they are too large for people to have face-to-face -face communication and to have water cooler conversations with everyone who's involved in a project that they're working on. So just by nature of their size, they tend to work in ways that are very similar to what we discussed here for distributed teams. Yeah, but I think they claim that it's, uh, there's an advantage in having a small group of, uh, for instance, five or seven people working together face to face. Um, totally, if you can get them all in one, again, if you can get the best team in one place, it is more effective than a distributed team. But you have to get them. Yeah, and your point is that if you're a small company, you just have you, you just not have the muscle to to bring all these people together, and th you have to compromise with the remote work. Something like this. Yeah, maybe. Um, I think even if you're a big company, you might not get the you're going to get Google. Get, Google obviously has world class talent, and they're able to attract it. But just because you're a big company that requires people to be in the office, it could mean that you're sacrificing talent. Um, and and that's, that's okay, right? That may be okay. Yeah, there are plenty of times at TeamSnap where I was just like, I wish I could get the four of you, get you in a room with a whiteboard for 10 minutes and solve <laughs> this problem, uh, and I can't. But, you know, on the whole, I think the good outweighed the bad in that case. Thank you. Cool. Shared whiteboard. Anybody? Uh, there's a new app. There's this phone app thing. What the hell is it? Hang on. I'll, I'll get you that answer before. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's, there's, this cool, there's this cool app that like adjusts the angle and you just point the camera at the whiteboard. I'm going to find it before the end of this talk. Um, I think one thing you're, you're underestimating is the, is the sort of the fetish quality that some executives have when they read something in, you know, CIO Week or some, you know, magazine like that, where suddenly, you know, the epiphany is everyone's got to work together in teams and so you get directives that affect maybe organizations of several thousand people in a big company, not that I would know directly, of course, um, that, that suddenly the edict goes out, there will be no telecommuting or something like that, even though there are some people who work, spend all of their time on teams that span the entire country. And, you know, and there's no concept here of a team in one place. It's all over the place and it's, and you know, and I've even heard executives, again, um, it is possible that I've, executives have been heard saying, um, you know, I, but I want to be able to go over to that person's cubicle and ask them a question. Well, the answer is they're on a conference call, so you can't ask them anyway. So, I, I mean, it's, none of this, you know, makes any direct sense, but I just get the feeling this is just a fashion of the month thing that has just stuck around for a year. You know, and, it, and it's, you know, it's sort of like fish and visitors. They should have gone away by now. Yeah, I mean, I, the future of how we all work, in my opinion, is not one in an office. In fact, I think it's going to decentralize even more than it is today. And whether Yahoo or Google or Twitter or Facebook or whoever has the idea of centralizing people now, 
I, I, I have to believe it's to fix something to then be able to decentralize later. I mean, we, that's the approach we took. You know, we, we, we centralized everyone and now we're, we're becoming much more distributed and have remote folks as well. But I think, you know, you look at the next five years and you look at the past five years, we're not gonna get bigger offices. We're gonna all be working more remotely from home. Saves on time commuting. I mean, I commute two hours one way to the office, right? I'd love that two hours back. Um, it saves on cost for employees inside of the office. There was the point I think Ben made about it kind of working inside of a coffee shop and the chaos and the interrupt driven tasks and everything else. You can actually get a little bit more focus when you're remote in your home. I can close my door and I can say, this is what I'm working on. But I think it's also important that we all build our own skill sets of being remote employees. And as Bill said earlier, making sure that we cut, we have a time cutoff. We're gonna, I'm gonna work from here to here today and I'm done and whatever I get done, that's it, you know, and, and walk away from it. Have communication, set of schedules, things along those lines. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, I would challenge anybody that said that remote working doesn't work because the teams that I work with today are probably some of the most communicative and efficient teams that I've worked with in my life and we're all remote. That being said, Sometimes I just need to fly out to Ottawa and get them all in a room and sit in front of a whiteboard because no, there is no really good solution for Rocket that. Rocket board is the thing that I was thinking Rocket of. Rocket board? I have not tried it yet, but it looks really cool. You know, Rocket to, board. Rocket board, we'll have to check that out. But yeah, sometimes you need to be in a room and, and we, do, we do do that. Um, but I, I agree <clears throat> with Mike that it, the future is remote work. Like it, it makes a lot more sense. It's a lot better on the employees. It's better on their families. You know, if you have a two-hour commute one day, that's basically another, you know, half a full-time job that you're spending sitting in your car. And I don't know about you guys, but as a fairly productive person, there's nothing that makes me, like, hate the universe worse than spending two hours sitting in traffic. Cause <laughs> Truth be told, that's why I call people. Well, <laughs> I'm sitting in my car, and I'm like, who can I call now? Mark. <laughs> Mark's, Mark's free. I know he's not doing anything. My team doesn't answer me. I call Mark. I'm like, they don't want to talk. Okay, Mark, I'll call Alspa. Yeah, he'll, he's always willing to talk. I'll call John. Yeah, I mean, the tools are only getting better. The internet connectivity, uh, you know, Comcast aside, is only getting better. It's, yeah, what? Yeah, I went there. Um, too soon? Too soon. But, but I mean, we're, we're moving to a, a world where the tools and the, and the networks and the processes are only going to push people more and more towards being distributed and, you know, I think the world's going to be a better place for it. Sorry, Comcast. It's better for the environment, too. Absolutely. Uh, comment and a question. The, the comment is Xerox Park did a live board 20 years ago. They rock. Um, I wish to God I had one today. Me um, too. The, the question I have is, uh, what are people using for a shared Kanban board across distributed teams? We use Trello and we hate it. <laughs> uh, we use Jira and we originally were using the Greenhopper plugin for Jira and what we found was that the workflow that we had set up through the board didn't work very well for us and the way that the team needed to work. So we actually custom rewrote um, our Kanban and renamed it Beer Can. Um, it still is Kanban, but it's our own version of it. Um, and there's a talk out there that I gave about it if you're interested. Um, it was at Surge two years ago. Is it available? It is available. Yeah, it's on YouTube, I believe. So, um, and that, that'll walk through everything from how we added different priorities and what the workflow is inside of our ops team. So, I guess kind of following on to the earlier question, how do you help to make those cultural changes and more importantly, increase the comfort level for some of these managers uh, or, or CIOs or whoever who may not be comfortable making that shift. And I say this from an organization that has a lot of, of offices, IT is distributed through a lot of those offices and we also have um, a lot of offshore support that we have outsourced you know, a lot of operations type stuff. So we sort of have a challenge where we're living it, but a lot of people aren't comfortable with it. And there's still people in certain offices, managers that are in offices that are somewhat remote from where a lot of the tech workers are, who are like calling people on the phone all the time. And, you know, relating to yesterday's thing about interruptive um, operations, it's hard to let the engineers 
focus when they need to, but also give the managers the information that they feel like they need in order to not feel like everything's just chaotic and out of control? Well, I mean, at Pythian, obviously we have a, a large remote workforce. Um, and I, I think the secret is in total transparency. So at Pythian, we, everything we do is recorded. Everything, you know, you were saying earlier, group chats being logs, right? And group chats being, chats being documentation. Um, you know, our ticketing system, we have a company policy that says, you know, if you're in an SSH session, that SSH session is getting pasted into that ticket, the whole thing. Obviously, scrub out anything that needs to be scrubbed out. But, um, and, and we do that for two reasons. One, total transparency to our customers, because there's no magic sauce, right? Like, everything we do, you can do. You can look at exactly what we did. Um, it would, but the other thing is, from a management standpoint, you know, we track our time, every one of us, myself included, even in management, we track our time down to the minute. So like our ticketing system has a timer in it, and we just go in there and we log, okay, this is what I've been doing for the last 30 minutes, this is what I've been doing for the last 15 minutes. So it, you can, and everybody's, my, mine, my team managers, the individual team members, is visible to everybody. Now sometimes you have to be careful about what you're putting in a comment, you know. <clears throat> Had a meeting with HR about getting rid of so-and-so. Um, but, um, but everybody can, <laughs> yeah, awkward, um, but you can, JK. but, <laughs> yeah, initials aren't good either. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but it's important because you can actually look at anybody else's day and see what did they do all day, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, very nice. So I, I, I'm curious what the fears would be from people wanting to make the adjustment. So if, if you wanted advice on how to start helping change things, which I think was the question that you had, um, I would ask very open and honestly um, the managers, what's your fear? Are you afraid that we're going to fail and you're going to get fired? There's, there's typically like that big elephant in the room where everyone's like, this is not going to work and it's going to come down on me. Right? The approach that, that we take in everything that we do from an engineering culture to a non-engineer culture is accept failures but don't lower standards. Um, it's going to fail. It's going to blow up and it's going to stink and you're going to be upset about it. And then it's going to be all right and you're going to learn from it. And I think that most managers, most executives who have these fears and that are constantly like, let me call Jimmy over there. Hey, what, what, did you get the laptop out? Oh, let me call again. Is it out yet? Is it out yet? There's a fear that their job that they're going to fail at their job, in 99% of the cases. All right, 90%. But the you know so I would address that first. I would start asking, hey, what's the fear, and how can we how can we start making you feel better that that's not going to be a failure, for you? Is it once a day you want me to check in? Should someone check in once a day? You know, do you understand that they need time to do their work? It doesn't take two hours to do a laptop, sometimes it could take six hours because it's wrong, we have to go back, we have to reimage, whatever it is, right? Um, so I would start ad by addressing the fear that people have about it and trying to work it from there. Um, I wouldn't just say, oh, let's do this. What I would say is, hey, can we also, this is the second piece of the advice that I would give, can we test this out? Can we do a small A-B test, ramp up, percentage, whatever you want, we, we push code that way. Um, so it's, it's very easy for me to grab that as a tool. But hey, let's test with just this group over here with this little small subset. Here's how we're going to measure success. Here's how we're going to measure failure. And let's give it three months and see how it looks. And, and you get hopefully a little bit of buy-in from that. And then you can scale from there. So those are two things that I would do. If, if I had, uh, had two pieces of advice for someone looking at that, one would be I think a lot of managers and executives focus a lot more on the capital P process than the, than the results. They want to be in control. They want to make sure that you know their hands are on everything else. Train people more to focus on clear deliverables than the process that gets it there. If people are delivering, great. If, and you don't need to be involved in every single decision. You don't have to be the puppet master. People aren't delivering, try to figure out why. And the second piece, I would say, kind of plugging my workshop from Tuesday, uh, you know, get get your technology folks, get your managers, take an improv class. Uh, you know, learn how to think on your feet, uh, not be thrown by failure. Uh, it'll help. It'll help you in that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, I think um, both uh, Wade and uh, and Mike touched on this: managing expectations and having clearly defined goals that you can report against. That you know, when you know, these managers that are concerned that they're going to, Mike's probably right. They're probably concerned that they're going to fail. Um, and what can help in those cases is for their, their employees to push back and say, hey, 
Am I getting my job done? Is, what is the work that you expect from me? Am I getting it done? If I am, you probably don't need to ask me every day if I'm getting it done. And it's just a matter of managing expectations and setting very clear goals that, that make it obvious whether things are getting done or not. We're just about out of time. I have two last questions. One is, um, have you found that any of these new sort of telepresence sort of things, full-time telepresence, that, that you like use that? And whether it's like one of these dual robotics roll around robots or, or whatever. And the other one is the obligatory um, remote worker video nightmares. I heard a story last night about a guy named Patrick. Um, I won't, I won't, I won't mention who, the, which company it was, or anything like that. If the person wants to talk about it, they can talk about it. <laughs> so Patrick is—he's uh, one of my managers. He's also speaking with me next week in another conference. So I'll try and be gentle so he doesn't totally ruin everything for us. But now he. It's, it's your typical nightmare story, right? You're working from home, you have a call, you have a meeting, you dial in, you forget your camera's on, right? It's kind of like rule number one, you dial in and you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be ironing pants and, it won't, and I won't be wearing them and the camera accidentally goes on. So nightmare story, but you know, that's a good lesson, right? Because we fail, we all fail. So the lesson was wear pants. <laughs> And, not optional. and he's very, you know, he's very humble about it. He's like, yep, should have been wearing pants. <laughs> as far as kind of the telepresence robot type thing goes, uh, ain't nobody got time for that. And for kind of horror stories, we did have our chief architect who, who loves his treadmill desk uh, and fell off of his treadmill in the middle of, <laughs> of a video call. So we've got gifts of that. And... <laughs> And those, those pop up uh, in Slack whenever someone says particular words, and they're quite funny. And really the only other kind of remote work horror story I've got is we, we interviewed a guy, we hired him, and he just never showed up, ever. Never heard another word from the guy. Start day came and went. He was up in Vancouver, B.C., uh, called him, nobody answered. Uh, finally, like a few days later called the number that I'd been interviewing the guy on, and some guy with an, an accent I couldn't quite place answered it, and is like, hey, is, uh, is, is homeboy there? And like, uh, no, I think he's in San Diego. Um, here's, his, here's his number there, and that number, uh, never, nobody picked up on it, and we never heard from him again. But we hired somebody better, so. <laughs> so um, we have um, a couple of doubles, those robots that can drive around with iPads mounted on them at our office. They're gimmicks. They, they're, they're fun to play with. That's, that's about all they have for value. They're fun to show off when customers come to visit. Um, as far as horror stories, I, the place where I worked previously where I was one of the few people that worked from home, my manager liked to come in at like 7 in the morning and book meetings for like 7.30 in the morning, and like stupid things like that. So one day we're on a video conference and I get up to go get a coffee and he comes back and there's like 20 people in this meeting and half of them have been dragged into the office but I just refuse to go. <laughs> so I'm on my video conference and he's talking and I, walk, I sit back down and, and he like stops he's like, Bill, Bill, wait, wait a minute, wait, hold on. Bill, are you wearing pajamas? And I went, yes, yes I am. This is what happens when you book meetings at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> They're Iron Man pajamas if you're wondering. <laughs> We gotta stop with that. <laughs> this is basically end, but I have one quick last story. We had a guy at Global Crossing. He was on the like software deployment team, and literally, he didn't do anything for a full year. He didn't do any work. He wasn't shy about this. He was just collecting the money, and then one of those big. Um, uh, not voluntary rifts came through and somebody called him up and said I'm sorry dude we've got to lay you off and you're gonna get six months of pay he literally laughed for five minutes <laughs> thank, thank you, you. and uh, lunch is upstairs I think that's true right at the vendor yeah lunch is upstairs at the vendor exhibit um, have a great rest of the day thanks <laughs>